All right, hey there, AP European History students. This is the first of two recorded slideshow lectures on the Cold War era from the end of the Second World War through the 90s. I'm hoping that my lecture, my presentation of the Cold War era, will supplement what you already know and what you have learned about in your United States history class. Where you learned about the Cold War era, I'm assuming mostly from the United States perspective, for this class, I'm going to focus more on the Soviet perspective, so how they perceived the Cold War era. And furthermore, I'm going to talk a lot about the Eastern Bloc countries, the countries in Eastern Europe that were part of the Warsaw Pact or were not part of the Warsaw Pact like Yugoslavia, but were otherwise communist. So in other words, I'm going to be focusing on the communist perspective of the Cold War era. And I hope that'll provide you with a nice balance from what you've already learned about in your United States history class. Now, there's obviously a lot that goes on with the Cold War and this whole era, which is several decades, which is pretty much the entire second half of the 20th century. So for my presentation of the Cold War, I'm not just going to focus on the communist perspective, I'm going to focus in on one particular country, and it is not the Soviet Union. I'm going to focus on the country of Czechoslovakia. Okay, so why Czechoslovakia? I'm going to focus on Czechoslovakia because this is part of my attempt to connect 20th century European history with all of European history. And there is a common theme that runs through Czech history, which is the struggle for freedom, both freedom as in sovereignty, political sovereignty. The people of, you know, way back when, Bohemia, wanted to be free. And then Czechoslovakia in the 20th century is also the struggle of freedom. So political uh, freedom um, and, and, and state sovereignty. It's also the story of individuals, individuals who have struggled for their own personal liberty. This story of national independence and individuals wanting to express themselves freely, this is something that is sown throughout all of Czechoslovak history. And so as part of my quest to tie in 20th century history with all of European history, I'm going to focus on the incredible story of Czechoslovakia. That, and I love the story of Czechoslovakia in the 20th century. And so this is something that's really easy for me to talk about. Okay, so hey, take a look at this image that I've got up here on the slideshow. It's an image that you've seen many, many times before. There is the capital of Czechoslovakia, and today the capital of the Czech Republic. And let's do some review of what you're looking at here in this picture. There is the, uh, probably the most famous, well, one of the most famous tourist attractions in uh, Czechoslovakia, the Charles Bridge that you see there. And then up in the top right-hand corner, you see the big church that is a Catholic cathedral that looks down upon the rest of the city of Prague. That is St. Vitus Cathedral. Like many cathedrals, it was built over the course of a thousand years. And then hopefully you remember that the large structure that you see built around St. Vitus Cathedral is the Prague Castle. You guys may remember that this is the largest castle in the world by square footage. When I was there in Prague in 2014 and we visited the castle, and by the way, that's what the people there call it. They just simply refer to it as the castle. Uh, I was told that if I wanted to visit every single room in this castle during visitor hours, that it would take me five days to see every room in the castle of Prague. So I just want to draw your attention once again to, Pro uh, to the Prague castle because when we get to the collapse of communism, uh, the castle comes back into play in the early 1990s in Prague. But remember, a lot happened in that castle. Uh, that is where the defenestration of Prague of 1618 happened. It was in that building that you see right there, at least obviously in one room of that building right there. So this is an important work of architecture in European history. Okay, now I'm going to show you this particular image, which is not a very, well, terribly interesting image, but this is uh, another touristy area of Prague today that is rich with cultural history. This is Wenceslas Square. As you see here, Wenceslas Square is quite simply a very long avenue. 
I do not know how long. I would reckon to say nearly a mile, but I don't know. Today, there are a lot of stores that you can shop at along uh, Wenceslas Square. Wenceslas Square is named after King Wenceslas, one of the original Bohemian kings. There is a large statue of King Wenceslas at one end of the square, sort of the beginning of it. And if you are familiar with the Christmas tune, Old King Wenceslas, and if you wonder, is this the same Wenceslas of King Wenceslas of Bohemia? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So there's Wenceslas Square. Why am I bringing up Wenceslas Square? Because it becomes an important gathering place several times in the history of Czechoslovakia in the 20th century. All right, so let's review some Czech history. Jan Hus. In the early 15th century, Jan Hus from Prague, a priest in the Catholic Church. Pretty much everybody was Catholic back then. This is 100 years before the Reformation. Ah, but Jan Hus can be thought of as a pre-Reformation reformer. People look at Jan Hus today as a Martin Luther of the 15th century. Now, at this time, Bohemia was part of the Holy Roman Empire. Bohemia was ruled by the Habsburgs, who were Austrian. The Bohemians felt that they were culturally and ethnically different from the Habsburgs. They were Slavic in their ethnicity, so culturally closer to the Russians than to the German Habsburgs. But in terms of language, culture, tradition, heritage, the Bohemians felt like they were different. Jan Hus had identified discrepancies between what had actually been written in the Bible, what the Bible said, and practices of the Catholic Church, and began writing about how the church should be reformed, at least his church in Prague. So this should sound a lot like Martin Luther. And this, is, this excited a lot of people in Bohemia. There was a lot of energy behind Jan Hus to create essentially a new and reformed church. Now, it goes without saying that in Rome, the church powers didn't really look favorably upon Jan Hus. It seemed as if the Bohemians were starting to break away, form their own church. But Jan Hus was doing this in an important period of time in history because the church was itself divided at this particular time. In the early 15th century, there were three men who were all claiming to be pope. And so the church was in disarray. So this governmental disarray allowed Jan Hus over in Prague to start to do his own thing. And of course, there was a lot, this, there was a lot of energy and excitement behind Jan Hus among the people of Bohemia and especially the people of Prague. But in the year 1415, a council was called by the Catholic Church. This is going to be the Council of Constance. They are going to meet in Constance, which is on Lake Constance uh, in Switzerland. And it is a council. A council is essentially a group of cardinals that get together. And they are going to decide, first and foremost, uh, what's the future direction of the church, who is going to be pope. But then they're also dealing with some of these religious issues that the church is facing at the time, including Jan Hus. So they invited Jan Hus to the Council of Constance to present his ideas, and the council would judge these ideas. Now, Jan Hus probably had very good reason to be concerned to go to see the Council of Constance because he probably knows they don't like him and they may try to kill him. But the council had promised Jan Hus safe passage. They essentially said, we want to hear your ideas. You will be promised safe passage. Come to the Council of Constance. So he does. He presents his ideas. When the council hears his ideas, they determine that Jan Hus is not a man, but a heretic. They have him arrested and they have, they have him burnt alive. And that was the fate of Jan Hus. Excuse me. Advance forward too quickly there. All right. So obviously the story of Jan Hus is 100 years before Martin Luther comes around, almost exactly 100 years. So when Martin Luther gets called to the Diet of Worms in 1521, and he too is promised safe passage, he has very good reason to be afraid. This is exactly what happened to Jan Hus. What makes Martin Luther different from Jan Hus is, of course, Martin Luther ended up being protected by Frederick the Wise. So Martin Luther lives, translates the Bible, Reformation begins. Back home in Bohemia, the 
uh, Bohemians started calling themselves the Hussites. This is back in 1415, and they rose up in rebellion against the, the Holy Roman Empire. And for a couple of years, they fought for a war of independence, a war that they eventually lost. So the Bohemians have this reputation of wanting to be independent, wanting to do their own thing, being culturally different from the Germanic Habsburgs. And the Germanic Habsburgs, for the most part, do not like them. And most of the Habsburg emperors all the way through the entire history of the Habsburgs, they don't like the Bohemians, except for, of course, one. And hopefully you remember the end of the 16th century, the beginning of the 17th century. There was a Habsburg emperor named Rudolf II, who was fascinated by the city of Prague and in fact moved his court to Prague. And then he did something that, and I hope this sounds very familiar to you guys and you're remembering it all, he does something that no Habsburg had ever done before. He provides radical religious freedom in his 1609 Letter of Majesty. He was personally fascinated with people who identified themselves as witches and warlocks and mathematicians and scientists or natural philosophers, as they called themselves back then. And with this, this edict of religious toleration, they all flocked to Prague. And so we have the golden age of Prague. All this thanks to our Habsburg emperor, Rudolf II. And hopefully you remember the image that you see there to the left by Giuseppe Archimbaldo, his... Uh, portrait of his very, very incredibly creative portrait of Rudolf II. Of course, the other Habsburgs determined that Rudolf II is unfit to rule. He is removed from power. Another emperor, Ferdinand II, comes to power, and he begins the crackdown in Bohemia. In the year 1618, he dispatches the uh, or several priests to Prague. This seems to be the beginning of an inquisition that's going to happen in Prague. And famously, in Prague Castle, three priests get thrown out of a window. This is the defenestration of Prague of 1618, the event that sparks the Thirty Years' War. Prague and Bohemia are briefly free for about a couple of years. They bring in a Calvinist king, King Frederick V, from uh, today, uh, the rhineland pfalz region of Germany. Back then it was called the Palatinate. Capital city was Heidelberg. And he came over to rule the Holy Roman Empire, led by a Bavarian general, sweep into Bohemia and they fight the Bohemians at the Battle of White Mountain, a battle that the Bohemians lose. And the Austrians, the Habsburgs, continue to rule over Bohemia. And then if we can move forward all the way to the year 1848, where there were nationalist uprisings all over Europe, nearly 50 of them. And if you remember, in the Austrian Empire in 1848, the Hungarians for a brief period of time go free. The Hungarians go free for a brief period of time until the uh, Russians under Nicholas I show up to put them back down and to deliver the Hungarians back to the Austrians. And this had inspired the Bohemians, or the Czechs. And by the way, hopefully you're noticing that I'm using the word Czech and Bohemian interchangeably. And that is because those two words, for the most part, are interchangeable. Bohemian is more of a Western word. Czech is more, most, more of an Eastern word. But for the most part, they refer to the same group of people and the same body of land. It's just that uh, in our telling of European history, Bohemian is... a uh, a word that we use to refer to sort of at the beginning, the first half of uh, the course, and Czech as it comes out later on in the 20th century. We start to refer to the people as the Czechs uh, for the second half of the course. It's confusing, I know. All right, so 1848, the Czech people begin to rise up, but uh, they are subdued. They are kept down in their place. But then in the year 1866, the Prussians, who are essentially being ruled by Otto von Bismarck, strike up a war with the Austrians. This is the Austro-Prussian War, otherwise known as the Seven Weeks War. It happens in the year 1866. The principal battle of the Austro-Prussian War is the Battle of Königsgrätz, which happens in, guess where, Czech, <laughs> the Czech region of the Austrian Empire. Otto von Bismarck actually uh, spends the night in Prague. But the Austrians lose because the Prussians have the needle gun. And out of this humiliating loss, the Hungarians rise up to demand 
almost entirely, almost complete independence. And in the year 1867, we have the creation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Hungary is an almost completely autonomous state within the greater Austro-Hungarian Empire. It has its own capital and government in Budapest. They share the same currency and the same military as the Austrians. Other than that, they can do whatever they want. This successful su secession of the Hungarians inspires the Czechs. They rise up. They want to go free too. And it's interesting how they decided to try to fight for their independence. If you look at this map here, uh, the region of Czechoslovakia is under the control of Austria, not of Hungary, during the Austro-Hungarian years. And so there was a parliament in Vienna that was established in the 1860s, where representatives from throughout the empire could come and meet, discuss issues, try to influence legislation. And representatives from Bohemia showed up with drums and cymbals, and they tried to disrupt the proceedings of this parliament by banging on drums and clashing cymbals until simply the government gave up and decided to let them go free. This form of protest did not work, and the Czech people remained part of the greater Austro-Hungarian Empire, and that lasts through the First World War. And then we get to the 1919 Peace Conference. And here we see in this image the big three from left to right, David Lloyd George of the United Kingdom, Georges Clemenceau of France, and at the far right we have the President of the United States who brought with him his 14 points, President Woodrow Wilson. And President Woodrow Wilson encouraged self-determination for all countries, especially uh, those countries that had been part of the empires of Europe, empires that had lost uh, the war at various times and uh, had let lands go free. And so due to, in large part, Woodrow Wilson, we have a very different map of Europe, especially Eastern Europe, following the First World War. And we have for the first time, for the first time, for the very first time, a free and autonomous region called Czechoslovakia. You can find it in on this map here. Some people have described it as being shaped like a pancreas, this little slither through the middle of Europe. It's considered to be uh, an Eastern European state, but that concept of being Eastern European is more a product of our imagination than it is geography. If you can find Prague on this map, you'll notice that it's actually further west than Vienna, and Vienna, Austria is typically considered to be a Western European city. And Prague is almost directly south of both Dresden and Berlin, Germany, two cities that are also considered to be Western European. If you go to Prague today, you will notice that there is a very large interstate that runs through downtown Prague, and this is called Woodrow Wilson Highway. There's also a statue of Woodrow Wilson in downtown Prague. Now that you know your history, you know why there's a big statue of Woodrow Wilson in downtown Prague. It's really because of him that Czechoslovakia got to go free in 1919. That and the fact that the Austro-Hungarian Empire was on the losing side of the First World War. So Czechoslovakia is free. Hooray, hooray, hooray. They have a democracy. Hooray, hooray, hooray. And then the 1920s happens. And then there's the rise of fascism. And then there's a Great Depression. And one by one, all of those countries in Eastern Europe tumble into some form of dictatorship. All but one, Czechoslovakia. When you get to the year 1938, Czechoslovakia is the one country in Eastern Europe that is free, that is democratic, and sadly, Czechoslovakia is the one country that is sold down the river by other democratic powers, specifically Britain and France. You hopefully have a clear memory of something called the Sudetenland Crisis, where Adolf Hitler in the late 1930s said that there are ethnic Germans that are living in a region of Czechoslovakia that borders our German border. And it is only natural that those German people should be part of Germany, not Czechoslovakia. So he begins to make threatening moves that he is going to take over Czechoslovakia. And to respond to this, here comes Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain of the United Kingdom, along with the French delegation. They meet with Adolf Hitler and they sign the Munich Pact. And the Munich Pact simply says, hey, Hitler, you can have this part of Czechoslovakia. You get to have the Sudetenland. We don't care. Of course, there were no Czechoslovakian representatives at the Munich 
meeting uh, in, 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 in September of 38, France and Britain simply decided to give part of Czechoslovakia to Hitler as a form of appeasement. Of course, Britain and France did say, Adolf Hitler, if you take any more land, this will mean war. And Hitler made a firm promise that he would not take any more land. That was, of course, a lie. And within six months, by March of 1939, the Nazis had taken over all of Czechoslovakia. Did the Czechs put up some resistance? Yes. Jan Opeltal was a medical student at the University of Prague. He organized a resistance movement to protest the invasion of the Nazis. The Czech police refused to arrest Jan Opeltal, even though they were under the direct order of the Nazis at the time to do so. But when the police refused to arrest Jan Opeltal, as he led a parade through downtown Prague. The Nazis that were there just began firing into the crowd. Jan Opatal was shot, wounded, and died several days later, the symbol of Czech resistance to the Nazis. All this was happening in 1939, before the war had begun. There was continued Nazi resistance during the years of occupation of 39 through 1945, and some of that resistance was communist. Of course, Nazism and communism are diametrically opposed. So if you don't like the fascist, then you may drift towards communism. And that was very helpful after World War II when the Red Army, the Soviets, spread westward and conquered Berlin in 1945, the spring of 45. You remember that in retaliation to all of the crimes and the horrific acts that the Nazis had committed in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Red Army was equally brutal in, retaliatory, in, in, in their retaliatory response as they conquered Germany. And as the Nazis left regions in Eastern Europe, there were a lot of communists that sprung up to begin to take control of cities, towns, governments, etc., one very important country that um, where there was a there was a anti-fascist, anti-Nazi, pro-communist group that rose up and came to power uh, was Yugoslavia, but the Red Army never actually went into Yugoslavia. So the Yugoslavs were kind of different; they were communists, but they distanced themselves from the Red Army and from the Soviet Union, and so they were communists, but they were not pro-Soviet, and that will remain from 1945 all the way through the end of the communist era in the, in, in the late 1980s and, and into the early 1990s. Yugoslavia is different. However, for almost all of the other Eastern European states, the Red Army has conquered them. Now, hopefully you remember the Soviet Union suffered, suffered greatly during the Second World War. They lost 20 million people. 20 million deaths. It's an astronomical number. Stalin wants to make sure that never again in history will the Soviet Union, will Russia be invaded. Russia, Russia has a history of being invaded from the West, whether it's the Swedes invading during the reign of Peter the Great, whether it's Napoleon invading during the, during the reign of uh, Alexander I, or whether it's the Nazis invading during the Soviet era. Russia or the Soviet Union always gets invaded from the West. So now that the Red Army is occupying these Eastern European countries, Stalin starts developing an attitude that he wants to use these countries as buffer states. So he wants to control them and that they forevermore will be the first line of defense from any other Western invasion. That is how Stalin looks upon Eastern Europe in 1945. Hopefully that makes sense. So during the last year of World War II, in February of 1945, the leaders of the three Allied powers met in the Soviet Union, in a city called Yalta, where they had the Yalta Conference. So this would be Winston Churchill of the United Kingdom, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States of America, and Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. And they met to discuss the future of Europe. 
Now, Hitler's still in power, the war's still going on, but there is a strong sense that the war is coming to a conclusion by February of 1945. And of big concern of the two men that you see here on the left, Churchill and FDR, the two guys who speak English and represent the democracies here, they are both very concerned about the spread of communism. The common threat of Nazism has brought these three men together, but now that the Nazis are most likely going to lose this war, and it's up for these three men to reconstruct the world after World War II, now there's going to be some tension that develops between the two democracies, the UK and the USA, with the communist dictatorship of the Soviet Union. So FDR and Churchill, well, they want to get the Red Army out of Eastern Europe and free and liberate Eastern Europe. Both FDR and Churchill had, in 1941, signed something called the Atlantic Charter, in which they said the USA and the UK are going to fight to free the people of the world. Now, how can we have fought World War II and then surrender Eastern Europe to, to a communist dictatorship? So these two men go into the Alta Conference wanting to get uh, Stalin to let go of Eastern Europe, get the Red Army out of Eastern Europe after the war is completed. Bring the Red Army back home. Now let's look at the, the situation from the perspective of Stalin. His people have lost an extraordinary amount. His country has lost an extraordinary amount of people. 20 million people are going to die by the end of World War II. And he looks at the two English-speaking heads of state as a couple of jokers. According to Stalin, the Soviet Union has won this war. The effort and the loss of life of the, both the British and the Americans was extraordinarily limited compared to what the Soviets did. Stalin feels like, I have no reason to respect either of these two guys. I'm going to do exactly what it is what I want to do. So during this diplomatic conference, Churchill and FDR have a tough task at hand. This was doubly hard for FDR because FDR is only a few months away from dying. He's ill at this point in time. This was a very difficult conference for him. But what they tried to do with Stalin is, well, they relied upon their own personal strengths. Both FDR and Churchill are comedic and they're charmers. And they really tried to put on the charm with Stalin. They tried to win his friendship by cajoling him, cajoling him talking about how great he is, joking with him, trying to be really friendly and chummy with him. Uh, uh, Churchill presented him with a British sword to honor him. And they tried to do all these things. But... Their ultimate goal is to get Stalin to let go of Eastern Europe after the war is over. Does this work? Well, here's what's agreed upon at the Yalta Conference. Stalin agrees that after World War II is over, the Red Army will retreat back into the Soviet Union, and that all of the countries that had existed prior to World War II in Eastern Europe, countries like Czechoslovakia, will once again be free and independent states. And he agrees to the most important thing, that all of these countries will have free elections. Stalin agrees to this, which might seem like a success for FDR and Churchill, but Stalin also knows that the anti-Nazi, anti-fascist forces that were in these countries that rose up during the retreat of the Nazis out of their country and the emergence of the Soviet Red Army into most of these countries in the East will create a situation that he can manipulate to ensure that absolutely all of these countries in Eastern Europe will be communist countries after World War II. Okay, so this is the Yalta Conference of February of 45. And a lot of historians believe that this is sort of the first event of the Cold War. So as we look at a map of Eastern Europe after World War II, we see regions in the this light red that are part of the USSR. And then the sort of pinkish colors there are going to be communist countries that are seemingly independent. But as we will learn, the Soviet Union, by the time 1950 rolls around, will be controlling these countries directly. Okay, so once again, Czechoslovakia. Here it is on this map. Territorially, territorially, it's its own independent state. It's got its own government at Prague. They had free elections. That, starting in 1948, were no longer free. They were manipulated. Only communist pro-Soviet politicians were able to uh, achieve seats of power. And Czechoslovakia, as we will learn throughout the lecture today, becomes essentially a puppet state. 
for the Soviet Union. Once again, Czechoslovakia is being controlled by a foreign power. But we will also see that the spirit of Jan Hus is still with them. There are still going to be some very brave individuals who are going to be willing to fight in various ways for their own independence. All right. So in the summer of 1945, the war is over in Europe. The United States of America is still fighting the empire of Japan in the Pacific. But the war is all done in Europe. And we have our last major World War II conference. This is the Potsdam Conference. Potsdam Conference was held in the summer of 1945. Potsdam is a suburb of Berlin, Germany. And hey, for what it's worth, uh, Potsdam, there's a lot of history in Potsdam. And I mean a lot of history, but uh, today Potsdam, Germany is known for being the Hollywood of Germany. This is where uh, a lot of films are made, like big production films are made in Germany is in Potsdam. So if you visit Potsdam, it's a pretty swank suburb of Berlin, and you might see a celebrity or two, or two. Not just German, but sometimes American celebrities who make European films. All right, but at this particular conference, we've got two very different people uh, here. Uh, Winston Churchill had actually been voted out of power as a new liberal government took over in the summer of 1945. And uh, the new prime minister, a liberal, is a man by the name of Clement Attlee. And you see him there on the left. Franklin D. Roosevelt in the United States of America died in Georgia in April of 1945. And he was replaced by his vice president from Missouri, Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman had uh, just found out about the Manhattan Project days before he had gone to um, Potsdam. So at this picture right here, he's just learned that the United States of America has a nuclear bomb. He knew nothing about this when he was vice president. It was actually held, he actually didn't know about it until well into you know being president, at least a couple months in as being president. All right, and the only familiar face here is Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union. All right, so why are these three men meeting? They are there to talk about the future of Germany. This is the primary thing that they want to discuss at the Potsdam Conference, the future of Germany. All three of their countries had been fighting the Nazis. Now the Nazis have been conquered. All of their armies are occupying Germany at the time. What are we now going to do with Germany? What type of government is it going to have? And what they ended up doing at Potsdam was dividing Germany up into areas of occupation. So the Soviet Union, the United States, the British, and the French would each have regions where their military would be stationed and, and they would occupy this particular region. The goal of the Potsdam Conference was then to find a way to reconstruct and, get this, reunite Germany under one government in which all three of these powers, the British, the French, and the, or the British, and the Americans, and the Soviets could agree to. Now what happened with this aspect of the Potsdam Conference was it sort of only half succeeded. Germany ends up getting divided into areas of occupation. Go figure, the democratic powers, they occupy the western side of Germany. So this would be Britain and France and the United States all occupy regions in the western side of Germany. And then the Soviets occupy the eastern side of Germany. And then, because it's, it's the capital, Berlin is also placed under occupation by all four of those countries. But even Berlin reflects this geographical divide, because on the western side of Berlin, there's going to be the American, the French, and the British occupying their, that part of the city. And then on the eastern part of Berlin, the Soviets will occupy that part of the city. And Berlin, as a whole city, is located within the greater Soviet eastern region of Germany. So that's how things are set up. Now the goal is, is each army helps you know, to reconstruct that part of Germany. Their goal is to you know, reunite Germany under a, a new government. But of course what that government is, it is never agreed upon by the democratic powers and the Soviet Union. So Potsdam only half succeeds. Uh, there's an occupation, there's a reconstruction, and we'll learn more about this reconstruction later. But Germany, of course, never gets unified. And by default, what happens is two countries are created. There is West Germany with its capital in Bonn, and it's a democratic country. And there is an East Germany with its capital of East Berlin. And that is, of course, a communist country that's pretty much a puppet government, or a puppet country 
uh, for the Soviet Union. And then within East Germany is West Berlin. And even though geographically it's located in East Germany, it is part of West Germany. And West Berlin, throughout the entire duration of the Cold War, is identified as this Western outpost within the Soviet realm. And throughout the duration of the Cold War, a lot of people believe that if World War III is going to happen, it's going to begin in, in Berlin. Uh, Stalin himself referred to West Berlin as a boat or, or a bone in our throats. <laughs> Let me say that again. Stalin referred to West Berlin as a bone in our throat. For him, it is extraordinarily unfair that the British, the French, and the Americans haven't just relinquished this part of Germany to East Germany. But for the British, the French, and the Americans, and especially for the Americans, this becomes an issue of pride. We're not giving up West Berlin. We are going to support the people of West Berlin. We have given them a democracy. We're going to make sure they get to keep it. We don't care where geographically it's located. All right, so that's the Potsdam Conference. Interesting. Now, the other you know, fun little story of the Potsdam Conference is at some point in time during this conference, Truman is talking to Stalin and mentions to Stalin, we've got an atomic bomb. Truman had just recently found out about this. Now, what's interesting is Stalin's response. Stalin tells Truman, without hesitation, I know, because Stalin had spies in places like Los Alamos, New Mexico, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and other places where we were developing the bomb. This becomes another major issue with the Cold War. Spies and the Soviet Union, even during World War II, had spies in the United States of America. Okay, so this is all uh, summer of 1945. The future is still very uncertain in terms of how these three allied powers are going to relate to each other. You know, are we enemies? Are we friends? Can democratic capitalist powers and, and, and communist powers, can we get along? You know, what does the future hold? And there was probably a little bit of excitement as well as anxiety with these meetings at this time. But this all kind of comes to a close, this opportunity. So yes, the end of the opportunity for the Western democratic powers to move forward with the Soviet Union in a more respectful and diplomatic manner ended in, the March, in March of 1946 with this particular speech. Sir Winston Churchill now no longer the Prime Minister of the UK. He had been voted out of power, so now he's essentially retired. He was visiting the United States of America, and he gave a speech in Harry S. Truman's home state of Missouri, and this speech is remembered as the Iron Curtain speech. This man describes the situation in Europe, and he gives his audience a metaphor for how they can understand the new post-war world. He says, from Stettin in the Balkan. I'm sorry, I totally said that wrong. He says, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across Europe. An iron curtain, this barrier, this border that cannot be permeated. He goes on to describe that on the western side of this Iron Curtain, people are free. And on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain, all those glorious ancient capitals, they are now under the shadow of a vicious dictatorship. This speech is one of the most important speeches in all of European history, probably all of world history. Winston Churchill, and probably because this is Winston Churchill that we're talking about here, had given humanity a metaphor by which they could understand the new situation. And it's not a positive one. It's not a diplomatic one. For Winston Churchill, things are very black and white. There's good guys and there's bad guys. There's people who believe in democracy and capitalism, and then there's people who believe in communism. And it seems like with this speech now, the world is diametrically opposed. And this is the Cold War. The Cold War is a period of time from approximately 1945 to 1991, approximately. Historians argue about the specific starting and ending points, in which you have two major superpowers in the world. One is the Soviet Union, and they represent a communist form of government and a communist economic system. And the other superpower is the United States of America. 
the United States of America representing a democratic and more a democratic government and a more capitalist economic system. Both sides see the other side as a threat to their national security and economic interests. Both sides also look at the other side as attempting to spread their ideology across the world. Now, in 1946, this might be perceived as just, well, two major countries with very powerful militaries that don't see eye to eye on what the best form of government is and what the uh, best economic system should be. And both sides are essentially trying to influence other countries to join their side and their way of life, their form of government, their economic system is going to spread. And this is seen as a, as a threat. But then things really heat up in 1949 because the Soviets did have spies in the United States of America. The United States has developed an atomic bomb in 1945. The United States uses two atomic bombs against the Empire of Japan to win World War II. But, by, but at that point in time, the United States of America is the only country with an atomic bomb. But because of those spies from the Soviet Union that were here, the United States or the Soviet Union is able to develop a, an atomic bomb relatively quickly. And by 1949, the Soviet Union has an atomic bomb too. Now the Cold War gets a lot more hostile. If the Soviet Union and the United States of America ever go to war, there will most likely be a nuclear exchange. This will mean the pot potentially the end of human life on Earth. Humanity now has the ability to destroy everything. It's a scary new world, which is why the Cold War tends to be defined as, or tends to contain all of these small hot wars that are in relatively poor countries or smaller countries like Korea, like Afghanistan, like Vietnam, like Angola, where essentially the United States of America and the Soviet Union are fighting each other through proxy by supplying their side with weapons or money or whatever that side needs, and then sometimes committing troops, like the United States committing troops to Vietnam and like the Soviet Union committing troops into Afghanistan. And the United States and the Soviet Union aren't fighting each other directly, but if one army is there, then the other country is going to supply... Okay, let me stop here. Let me explain this more clearly. If one of the superpowers is there, like the United States in Vietnam, then the other superpower, the Soviet Union, is going to supply like the North Vietnamese, with, with weapons or material or whatever it is that they need to help fight the Americans. And so all these little proxy wars happen throughout the Cold War era. Now, does this mean that Winston Churchill started the Cold War? Absolutely not. Winston Churchill just articulated the situation as he saw it. And it probably was how a lot of people saw it at this time. There was all this tension building up around, especially Eastern Europe, especially Berlin, especially Germany. You know, what's the future of the world hold? What, how, how are different countries going to relate to each other? I think what makes this speech meaningful is that pretty much everybody embraced it like that. And for most people's mind, in most people's mind throughout the Cold War, it was one side against the other. And there was this sense that during the Cold War, one of these sides is going to win or Maybe not. Maybe the future of humanity is going to be eternally divided like this. And if so, is there any way to reduce the tensions on both sides? And this was the Cold War era. All right. Guys, this is the continent that we're studying. Europe. Europe is now the dividing line for the Cold War. The Iron Curtain runs through the middle of Europe, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. It runs through the middle of Germany. Europe is physically and ideologically divided. On the side of the Soviets, they look at Winston Churchill, who gave the speech in the United States, as somebody who's made a call for war. It's one side versus the other. It was probably easy to place blame on Churchill. I think the Soviets had a very similar understanding of what was going on at the time. But the Soviets see the United States as an aggressor. And they really start to feel validated upon looking about, uh, at the United States in this way when it comes to another country in Europe, Greece. 
There are a lot of great stories of the Greek resistance during World War II, especially on the island of, of Crete. The Cretans on the island of Crete refused to completely submit to the Nazis, and they committed these incredible acts of terrorism against the Nazis. And terrorism isn't even really the right word. They just found very creative ways to resist the Nazis. They even captured a high-ranking Nazi commander and had him shipped off to Egypt in one of the most incredible acts of, of, of kidnapping in the entire history of humanity. It's a great story. But anyways, after World War II and the Nazi retreat, well, then there were various factions that arose in Greece for, you know, who was going to rule Greece now that the Nazis are gone. And the majority of the Greeks were communist. And in all likelihood, had all things remained the same, Greece would have become a communist country. But there were non-communist forces that were there. And they picked up arms to fight the communists. So Greece descends into civil war immediately following World War II. And it's the communists versus the non-communists. Now, prior to World War II, the United States of America stayed out of a lot of people's business. I mean, think of Spain and the Spanish Civil War. We were not there. Our government was not there. We let Spain fall to Franco and the Nationalists. After World War II, there is a strong sense in the American government that we cannot let countries fall to this new form of dictatorship, communism. So the President of the United States after World War II is Harry S. Truman from Missouri. Is he going to stand back and let Greece fall to communism? No. Harry S. Truman decides to commit American money and arms to the anti-communists in Greece. He gets the support of Congress. This money and material goes to Greece. We are now in the Greek Civil War in 1947. Harry S. Truman clarifies his idea for the United States of America and the role we're going to play in the post-war world. And this is remembered as, quite simply, the Truman Doctrine, which states this. The United States of America is going to support any country that is non-communist from falling to communism. All right. The United States of America is going to support any country that's non-communist from falling to communism. That doesn't mean necessarily that country has to be democratic, you know, like us. They don't have to really fully believe in the principles in which we believe. They just can't be communist. And we'll support them. We're going to do this, of course, to contain the spread of communism. And this containment attitude of the Americans is going to drive much of our foreign policy, much of the American foreign policy throughout the Cold War. So when we get involved in places like Korea, Vietnam, why are we there? We're there to contain the spread of communism. And this goes back to Truman's decision uh, to aid the anti-communist forces in Greece in 47. All right, so from the American perspective, Good job. We're committing American money and military aid to the people fighting against a communist dictatorship in Greece. So we're stopping the spread of communism. We're protecting the freedom of people around the world. Now, let's look at this from the Soviet perspective. And the image that you, uh, you have on your screen here is, an Amer is, a, is a Soviet cartoon where you have an American Uncle Sam holding up an Uzi that has an American dollar sign on it, driving away the communists. This is how the Soviets perceived the Americans. Using American money and military might, they are driving out the communists, and the communists in Greece were the majority. So the Soviets are like, oh, the Americans say they believe in democracy, but they don't because here's the majority of people in Greece who believe in, in communism, and yet the Americans are supporting the minority of people there so that they can spread their ideological perspective. In the end, the anti-communist forces win in Greece and establish their government in Athens, and this government in Athens was politically and economically very unstable, and it remains unstable to this very day. Greece almost had another civil war in the year uh, 2010 after the 2008 global economic recession. It hit Greece really hard, and that's for reasons probably beyond the scope of this lecture, but the Greeks or the Greek government was just so in debt. They had a lot of social services that the government paid for that the government had no money for, and they just had to essentially soak money out of the EU. And the European Union had to try to figure out what to do with Greece. Were they going to continue to help Greece and pour money into it or, or, or just let Greece go, let them out of the EU? And this created a lot of economic and political instability in, in Greece. All right, but back to the 1940s. All right, the United States of America. 
after World War II enters into one of the greatest economic booms in all of world history. The period of time of the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s in the United States of America was a time of unprecedented economic growth. Wow, what a wonderful thing for the people who grew up during the Great Depression to now be able to buy their own home, a couple of cars, raise a big family, have a lot of career opportunities. It was an amazing time in the United States of America. Woohoo! But we also, after World War II, learned the lesson of uh, World War I, which was you cannot, you cannot just economically destroy your enemy and expect that this is going to create a lasting peace. John Maynard Keynes had correctly predicted that because Germany had been economically destroyed with the Versailles Peace Treaty, that they would someday rise up and start another world war, and he was correct. So now after World War II, the United States of America is more committed to, I guess what we could, what we could call a Wilsonian policy, that we are going to forgive our enemy, and we're going to work together cooperatively in a form of friendship. Our Secretary of the State, uh, our Secretary of State at the time under Harry S. Truman, was General George Marshall, and he is remembered as one of the chief architects for what we call the Marshall Plan. And the idea of the Marshall Plan is very simple. It's brilliant. It worked. It was not without its critics, but it created a lasting peace in Europe, or at least in Western Europe. Here was the plan. The United States of America is a wealthy country. We are now going to commit billions of dollars in foreign aid to any war-torn country that requests it. So we are going to pay for the reconstruction of countries. Countries like Germany, France, uh, even Britain, uh, we'll have a similar plan that we'll use with Japan. So there's this joke about the United States of America that they, the United States of America first bombs you to smithereens and then pays to reconstruct you. And that's pretty much what the Marshall Plan was. But it was also brilliant. And I want you to understand some of the details of the Marshall Plan in terms of what made it so brilliant. First of all, a country couldn't just request money. Like West Germany couldn't say to the United States of America, hey, we need $5 billion. Can you hand it over? The, in order to request the funds, you had to identify the products uh, that you needed for your reconstruction. So you essentially had to create an itemized bill. Here's what we need the money for. And so the United States of America looks at it, approves it, and then gives you the money. And of course, the United States of America is going to say, well, we notice that you need a lot of steel here. You need a lot of timber here. You need a lot of food here. All right, this is fine. Guess where you can buy this stuff? The United States of America, of course, because we're making all this stuff. So it benefits us too. So we give them the money. We give the money to West Germany. And West Germany says, okay, danke schön. We've got three, you know, $5 billion or whatever now. Okay, now we're going to buy steel and bread and food and all the stuff from the United States of America. So America is doing well because of the Marshall Plan as well. Even though this is billions of dollars that it came out of the American taxpayer that's going abroad, uh, that mu some of that, a lot of that money is being used to generate and to stimulate American, um, the American economy as well. So it's kind of a win-win. Now, there's another win-win aspect of this too, which is this. In order to receive money from the Marshall Plan, you had to agree to open up trade with every other country that was receiving money from the Marshall Plan. So that explains this little propaganda poster that you see here together, where it says, Whatever the weather, we must move together. So if West Germany is taking billions of dollars from the Marshall Plan, which they do, and France is taking billions of dollars from the Marshall Plan, which they do, that means that West Germany and France are going to have to get rid of centuries of antagonism and be nice to each other, to cooperate with each other, to trade with each other. And that was a beautiful thing, and that worked. The Marshall Plan is is an amazing thing. And one last thing, uh, this picture is taken from France. These are French children given a free lunch uh, from, American, from the American Marshall Plan. And so think of what this does for the reputation of the United States of America in Europe. I mean, first we liberate you from the Nazis, now we're feeding you and rebuilding your countries. I mean, can America be even more great at this moment 
I mean, I'm sure all these little French kids, as they're filling their bellies, are probably also thinking to themselves in some way, shape, or form, hey, merci beaucoup les États-Unis. Thanks, America. And this was great for the United States of America. Okay, so who were the opponents of the Marshall Plan? Uh, mostly American citizens who are really concerned about the fact that billions of dollars of taxes is, are going abroad. This was not without criticism. Uh, because this is really unprecedented in American history. We've never done this before. Okay, so this was the Marshall Plan. We are reconstructing Europe. Germany, West Germany in particular. The first uh, chancellor of uh, West Germany was an old man named Konrad Adenauer. He uh, politically had uh, opposed Hitler in the 20s and 30s and happened to survive the war. And so he was a perfect candidate to be the first president of a democratic West Germany. And he's responsible for overseeing what is called the German economic wonder of the 1950s. Both Germany and Japan, here are two countries that the United States of America fought, bombed, and then gave a whole bunch of money to. The amazing thing is that both of these countries did a fantastic job of using that money wisely. Now, this is why the United States of America just didn't want to give like, you know, a few billion dollars and said, hey, there you go, have fun with it. We want to know exactly what they were doing with it so that they would actually, there wouldn't be any uh, embezzlement of this money. You know, the United States of America has given money to some developing countries and it's all been like taken by a warlord while, their people, while, while the people starve. The United States of America didn't do this with the Marshall Plan. We wanted to know exactly what they were doing with the money. And Conrad Adenauer used this money very wisely and he took old uh, war industries like BMW, which made uh, uh, engines for fighter planes in World War II. And of course, they turned in the BMW into a, a car company. And this thriving car company comes out of uh, Germany as part of, as a great example of the German economic wonder. Uh, the Volkswagen bug, Volkswagen had been a, a car company for a long time. Uh, Volkswagen was not started by the Nazis. There's a lot of myth around the founding of, of Volkswagen as being started by the Nazis. They were not started by the Nazis. But both BMW and Volkswagen represent industries that are making this incredible comeback um, in Germany. And Germany is rebuilding itself to become this incredible economic power, which it is today. And let's remember, this is what Germany was like in 1945, completely blown out. And my other favorite story about the reconstruction of Germany involves this particular city, their capital city of Berlin and specifically West Berlin. Um, there are, for reasons that I hope I don't have to explain, there are a lot of, well, there aren't a lot of men living in Germany at this point in time. There are mostly women and children and some elderly, but, but you know, most of the guys were in the military and most of the guys are now dead. So Germany has a depletion of the workforce. And so they open their doors to a particular group of people to invite them in. And the group of people that they invited in were the Turks. Turkish men were given a five-year visa if they would be willing to come and live in Berlin, Germany to help rebuild Germany. So millions of Turkish men leave Turkey for Berlin, Germany. This changes the face of Germany. These workers come and live in Berlin and they rebuild Berlin. And then their five-year visa is up, but this is a city that they've built with their own hands. This is, for all intents and purposes, their city. So do they leave? Do they go back home to Turkey? No, they stay in Berlin, which is why Berlin has a larger Turkish population than Istanbul does today. So these are the new Germans. I particularly love this. I love this particular image, and I love it because I know how much Adolf Hitler would have hated it. A new very multi-ethnic Germany. And Berlin, Germany has returned to the spirit of Berlin of the 1920s, which was culturally and ethnically diverse. It has gone back to being one of the world's great cities. All right, but if I can revisit the Marshall Plan here again, the solely perspective of the Marshall Plan is, oh, look at the United States, this capitalist economy. They've got money. And what are they doing with their money? They're buying their friends. Did the United States of America offer the Marshall Plan to countries in Eastern Europe too? Countries like Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, East Germany? Oh yes, we did. But Stalin had instructed these companies, uh, con these countries to turn down American economic aid. The Soviets saw the Marshall Plan as a form of economic imperialism. You take money from the United States of America, you are now indebted in some way, shape or form to the United States of America. 
what was actually happening in the Soviet Union at the time was sort of the opposite of the Marshall Plan. Um, Stalin, in order to rebuild the Soviet Union, was depleting resources from Eastern European countries like Hungary, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, and bringing those resources to the Soviet Union to rebuild the Soviet Union. So the Soviets are doing essentially the opposite of the Marshall Plan. They're taking from the countries they've conquered. But from the Soviet perspective, the Marshall Plan is a form of aggressive American capitalist imperialism. And this is too, according to the Soviets. In an ongoing effort to show the countries, the democratic countries of Western Europe, that the United States of America is their friend, is their ally, and does have their back, and will help them in any future military conflict, especially against the Soviet Union, the United States of America creates a peacetime defensive alliance. This is the first time that the United States of America has ever done this in its history. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, founded in the late 1940s, referred to simply as NATO, was established as a defensive alliance by the United States of America. So, in other words, Western democratic countries like Italy, France, Britain, Belgium, West Germany, the Netherlands, they join NATO. And they join NATO because when you join NATO, you join a defensive alliance so that you are not alone in this new post-war world where there is an iron curtain and it's one side against the other. Little Belgium might not be able to resist a Soviet invasion, but if Belgium has an alliance with France and Italy and West Germany and Britain and it has the might especially of the United States of America, then Belgium is going to be a lot more secure. And that's what NATO is. It's a defensive alliance. Now, because of this, what this will entail is the United States of America setting up military bases in these countries. So now the United States of America has permanent military bases in NATO countries. Now, you're the Soviet Union. How do you perceive that? The United States of America is now setting up permanent military bases in Western Europe in these NATO countries. The Soviet Union, are gonna, they're going to see this as a clear threat. Now, the United States of America's response is, whoa, no, 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 no. This isn't aggressive. This is defensive. This is a defensive alliance. So if you feel threatened by our presence here, hey, USSR, good. Don't mess with any of these countries. Don't spread communism. But of course, the Soviets probably aren't going to perceive it like that. Now, it might be worth saying, here's what NATO is not. NATO is not to be the United States of America controlling other countries. NATO is not to be a platform through which the United States of America could, let's say, influence elections in France or something like that. But because of the Marshall Plan and because of NATO, there is first a sense of gratefulness towards the United States of America but as the years roll on, some people, and even people within these NATO countries, start to look at the Americans as imperialists. Uh, one country in particular is going to be France. And France is going to drop out of NATO for a period of time. And they get rid of all the American bases that are, that are in France. But this is not what NATO is set up to be. It is set up to be, and I reiterate it again, a defensive alliance. But naturally, the Soviets see it as a form of aggression, so they form their own defensive alliance. Named after the capital of Poland, they form the Warsaw Pact. And the Warsaw Pact is supposed to be, again, I reiterate, a defensive alliance among the Soviet Union and those Eastern Bloc countries, the satellite states, countries like Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, etc., Yugoslavia will never become part of the Warsaw Pact because Yugoslavia fears that this is, you know, even though they're communist and they might find themselves vulnerable or being under attack or trying to be undermined by the United States of America, uh, they feel that this might be, the Warsaw Pact might be a way for the Soviet Union to control these other communist countries. But the Warsaw Pact is established to be a defensive alliance among the communist countries. So when a lot of people think about the Cold War era, they think of it as NATO versus Warsaw Pact. And if I can take it to the future right now, 
the Warsaw Pact is going to collapse when the Soviet Union collapses in December of 1991. There is today no more Warsaw Pact. So in the 1990s, if there's no Warsaw Pact and there's no Soviet Union anymore, there's no communism, shouldn't NATO have gone away? NATO doesn't go away. And in fact, NATO expands. And countries that were once part of Warsaw Pact, countries like Poland, Czech Republic, they're now part of NATO. Even countries that were once part of the Soviet Union itself, like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, are now part of NATO. And NATO expanded. Now, why did NATO expand? Well, this would have been happening during the presidential administration of George Bush Sr. in the early 1990s, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed during his administration. He could have disbanded NATO. He, he could have took, taken steps to do that. But what the United States saw at this point in time in history was an opportunity to expand democracy, to protect the freedoms of people, and understand these countries wanted to be a part of NATO. They wanted the protection of the United States of America, especially after living under the long shadow of the Soviet Union for nearly you know, for the whole second half of the 20th century. Countries like Poland were like, yes, please, we want to be part of NATO. And so NATO expanded. But today, this if you go to Russia, if you could, just in your imagination, go to Russia and you could go to uh, Moscow, and you could meet the people who advise Vladimir Putin or even talk to Putin himself. And you ask them, you know, what's so bad about the United States of America? They would say NATO today, NATO, uh, you know, the Cold War is over. So why does NATO still exist? And why is NATO expanding? So the existence of NATO is still a volatile issue in today's world. All right. In the late 1940s, Joseph Stalin really wanted to get rid of the, the, the Western Allied occupation of West Berlin. And so in beginning in 1948, Stalin comes up with his plan to capture West Berlin, which entailed blocking off all traffic that went in and out of West Berlin. In other words, his plan was simply to starve out the West Berliners so that they had no food, no resources, supplies would dry up, and essentially they would, in some way, shape, or form, surrender to uh, the Soviet occupation of East Germany. This is essentially Stalin uh, pounding his chest and challenging the United States of America. What are you going to do about this? Are you going to come and invade? Are you going to try to invade uh, Eastern Germany? And this is the first time that the United States of America looks upon West Berlin and has to make a decision. Do we let West Berlin fall? Or do we in some way stand behind the people of West Berlin and say, no, we are, we are going to protect you. We're going to make sure that you're never communist. And we responded famously with uh, something called the Berlin Airlift, in which we took uh, airplanes and, uh, and bombers, essentially, and stripped them down and filled them with supplies, uh, food and other supplies, but mostly food. And we flew this stuff continually for nearly a year into West Berlin to keep West Berlin alive. And this was... Well, first of all, let me tell you what this was not. This is not the going up of the Berlin Wall. A lot of people hear about the Berlin Blockade of 48. A lot of students, and they think, oh, this is what the Berlin Wall was built. No, the Berlin Wall is built in 61. So we're still over a decade away from the construction of the Berlin Wall. This is just the uh, Soviets blockading the city of West Berlin and the United States of America making its decision for the first time under the Truman administration. We are not going to let West Berlin fall. And it's a decision that we're going to... Um, keep making throughout the duration of the Cold War. And similar to the Marshall Plan, uh, the Berlin Airlift creates all of this love for the Americans. Uh, we brought in these bombers, uh, a whole bunch of chocolate bars and chewing gum, and that's how a lot of uh, West Berlin children remembered the Americans as the guys that brought the candy bars. I mean, who wouldn't love the Americans? All right. A major turning point in the Cold War comes in the spring of 1953 when Stalin dies. The leader of the Soviet Union dies. After this, there's this big question mark. Well, what next with the Soviet Union? Who's going to be the new general secretary of the Central Communist Party and the Politburo in Moscow? Who, who's going to lead? And what will he be like? Will he be like Stalin? Or will he be a completely different type of leader? And what does this mean for Eastern Europe? Here's where things get interesting. In East Berlin, over a million men are working and po with receiving poverty wages. They can barely afford to feed their families, so they go on strike. 
give us more money. Now here in the West, we hear about a strike and we'd say, well, if we had to label it with a, with a, with a, with some label from the political spectrum, we'd say, well, a strike is something that's very uh, left-leaning. It's very socialist. It's quasi-communist. But here you have this communist state and people are going on strike because their economy is so horrible and these people aren't getting paid that much that they want, a, a, they want better wages. And so they go on strike for better wages for their family. So how did the Soviets respond to a strike in East Berlin? In 1953, the Soviets sent in the military to violently put down the strike. There were Soviet soldiers that were expected to shoot these Berliners that were on strike. They were commanded to shoot, the, to shoot these workers that were on strike. And there's actually a memorial in Berlin today, right next to the Brandenburg Gate, where these Soviet soldiers said, no, we can't shoot these civilians. And so those Soviet soldiers were then shot by their, sol by, by their comrades uh, because they were said, okay, they were told, okay, you can't shoot them, then we're going to shoot you. They were given a choice. Kill them or you get killed. And they refused to kill. So amazing act of courage and heroism and literally self-sacrifice on the part of a few Soviet soldiers. But this strike was crushed. And there were over a million uh, workers in East Berlin who went on strike in 53. This is a clear sign of resistance against Stalin's Soviet Union. The people in some of these satellite states, including in East Berlin, they want to do their own thing. So what happens in Moscow? Well, the Politburo, which is the single party parliament in Moscow, so everybody there is a communist. Everybody, there's only one party. It's not like going to Congress and there's Democrats and Republicans. There's only one party, the Communist Party. They selected their next premier, their next leader, and they selected Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was actually a commander at the Battle of Stalingrad. He had survived the purges. He was a respected member of the communist government. He was a respected member of the Soviet government in Moscow. So he gets selected to be the next premier of the Soviet Union. And there's all this kind of interest. What type of leader is he going to be? And one of the first things that he does is he gives a speech to the Politburo. This is remembered as the secret speech, although there was really nothing secret about it other than the fact that it was a speech delivered specifically to the Politburo when it was not, you know, a speech that was a public speech. And in this secret speech, he denounces some of the things that Stalin did, such as the purges, such as neglecting to acknowledge the mass starvation of the collectivization policies from the, in the 1930s. Khrushchev announces that he is going to be lifting some of the extreme censorship of the Soviet Union, and there is going to be more freedom for creativity and the arts in the Soviet Union. And so the secret speech is remembered as being a process of what is called de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union. So this sounds really good. It sounds like, you know, people are going to be like, oh, thank goodness, Whew. we'll get to be more free now in the Soviet Union under Nikita Khrushchev. Well, not everybody liked it, especially high-ranking members of the Politburo, who will be known as the hardliners, because they're like, wait a minute, if you start letting everybody like talk about this stuff, then there'll be complaints, there'll be criticisms, um, this will destabilize the Soviet Union, will be seen as weak. It's best just to have one policy, tell everybody you're either with us or against us, any potential political enemies get sent off to the gulag, and that's it. And Khrushchev has, is going to spend his entire career as pr premier of the Soviet Union dealing with these hardliners, D these guys who think that de-Stalinization is going to make the Soviet Union weak. And so this makes Nikita Khrushchev a very interesting guy. And he's remembered as sort of this, in this way in, in Russia today. He wanted to do all these internal reforms in the Soviet Union. Um, this, the, the Khrushchev years, for those people who grew up in the Soviet Union during the Khrushchev years, remember him as sort of this idea guy who was interested in, in perpetual reform. So he wanted to reform like agriculture. He wanted to reform industry. And kind of any new hip, hot idea that came along for reforming, he did it. And this was a top-down bureaucratic Soviet state. He, he said he did it, and here's how we're going to do it. And he would change, you know, industries. And it ended up kind of not working out very well. <laughs> 
anybody who's ever had a job where orders come for from like the top down in terms of the best way to do things and the workers on the ground are like uh, this isn't going to work um, that was Khrushchev's Russia um, there were all these reforms he loved the idea of reform and he tried to reform all these industries and for the most part it doesn't work but there's a little bit more freedom in the Soviet Union freedom of expression and such but the pol- but the hardliners in the Politburo are like oh you're making the Soviet Union look weak so Khrushchev is also remembered by trying to appease the hardliners by saying, we are going to be tough on the United States of America. And internationally, we're going to do everything we can to destabilize the United States of America. And this is going to culminate in one major event that is going to bring the the entire world to the brink of a nuclear war. So that's Khrushchev, reform from within, have all these reforms from within, but uh, it'd be tough on the United States of America. Uh, most people remember Nikita Khrushchev as getting a, giving a speech in the United States of America, telling the United States, we will bury you. We will bury you. Did Nikita Khrushchev tell the United States of America, we will bury you? Yes, he did. But this quote has been taken out of context. Here's what Nikita Khrushchev was trying to say. The United States of America has existed since the 18th century, since, since 1776. And they've been growing at a certain trajectory to become a superpower in the world. But we, Soviets, have only existed since 1917. And look at how our trajectory has shot up. And look at how we're advancing. You know, you guys, you Americans have been around for a couple centuries. We've been around for half a century. And we're, we've already caught up with you. And so we're going to pass you by. We're going to develop, develop beyond you. And we will emerge as a superior civilization in history, leaving you behind in the ash heap of history. We will bury you. Okay, so that is what Nikita Khrushchev meant when he told the Americans, we will bury you. A very famous uh, Soviet writer at the time, I should probably call him Russian, not Soviet. He hated the Soviet Union, uh, was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Uh, he was a writer. He was highly critical of the Soviet government during the Stalin years. He was placed in a gulag, and he was actually let out of the gulag by, by, uh, um, by Khrushchev, or at least by Khrushchev's reforms. And uh, after which uh, he wrote about his experiences in the gulag. He wrote a bit, several huge books about life in a gulag. And then um, he also wrote this very famous shorter book called A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn will eventually emigrate to the United States of America, where he becomes the celebrated writer who lives here. He's passionately anti-communist, passionately anti-Soviet. So go figure, a lot of Americans like him until the Vietnam War rolls around. And then he becomes very pro-America in the Vietnam War. He really thinks that the Americans should continue to fight in the Vietnam War to fight communism. Uh, Not all Americans agree with that at the time. And so uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn becomes a bit of a controversial figure here in the United States in the late 1960s. And then later on, he becomes a big supporter of Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. There's Alexander Solzhenitsyn. All right. Now, what I would like to focus on is the impact of Nikita Khrushchev on Eastern Europe. This secret speech and the de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union has this incredible impact on the Eastern Bloc countries, on the satellite states, and Poland is first. They think like, all right, this is it. We're going to go free. We're going to be able to do our own thing. We don't have to live under the shadow of the Soviet Union. And so Poland is, and this is going to sound like history repeating itself, Poland is going to have its own uprising. Once again, it's named after a month. This is Polish October of 1956. The president of Poland is an individual whose name I will butcher because I do not speak Polish, Władysław Gomułka. And Gomułka gives all these passionate speeches about how Poland is going to democratize. Poland is going to democratize. What's this mean? It means we're going to have a multi-party system in Poland. We're going to have economic change in Poland. And Gomolka is extraordinarily popular. News of this is then broadcast around Eastern Europe and other countries get inspired by it. But what happens to Poland? It's interesting. Gomolka gets all of these supporters, people who rise up in the Polish government in Warsaw, because Gomolka had asked for suggestions for how Poland should be reformed. And so people respond to his call and they give him ideas, suggestions for, you know, how to reform the government. Gomulka listens to all of them and then imprisons them. After these people give uh, get placed into prison, 
Very few people come forward with suggested ideas for reform for Gomolka, and Gomolka maintains a one-party communist system in Poland with the support, the mutual support of the Soviet Union. So what happened there? Was Gomolka just being a jerk, setting people up? Well, probably what happened was this. Gomolka was serious about genuine reform in October of 56. Then the Soviets threatened him with something, assassination, taking over your country, who knows. And Gomolka essentially, in order to save his own skin, changed his tune by taking all these democratic reformers and locking them up in prison. Anyways, nothing changes in Poland. But Hungary. News of Polish October spreads south to Hungary, and the people rise up in the street. 50,000 people rose up in the streets of Budapest, demanding democratic reform. The president of Hungary at the time was Imre Naj. If he were here in the United States today, we'd probably pronounce his last name Nagy, but so far as I can speak Polish, his name was pronounced in Poland, or I'm sorry, not Hungary, sorry, wrong country. So long as I can uh, say his name as I've heard it said in Hungarian, his name was pronounced Imre Naj. Imre Naj, how does he respond to the people rising up? He supports them and actually broadcast his support from a radio station in downtown Budapest. I love showing you the image of this because you should be able, as a good AP European history student, to look at this image and know that it is a Hungarian image because you are looking at Magyar Radio in Budapest. And you should say, oh yeah, Magyar, those are the old Hungarian aristocrats. Yeah, they, they, that's, that's Magyar Radio. So now you've got tens of thousands of people on the streets in Hungary. You've got a president who supports them. How does the Soviet Union respond? The Soviet Union responds by a full-fledged invasion. They send in the tanks. Imre Naj locks himself in the radio station and he transmits, he broadcasts from this radio station. Now the thing is, this is over the radio. So it's going to be heard by everybody in Eastern Europe and in Central Europe as well. Westerners are going to be able to hear this. So we're going to know exactly what happened in Hungary. And in his very sad last transmission in November of 1956, Imre Naj, knowing that the world can hear him, is begging the world to look at the Soviet Union for what it is, a brutal dictatorship that has no respect for the rights of of humans and listen to what he says this fight is the fight for freedom by the hungarian people against the russian intervention and it is possible that i shall only be able to stay at my post for one or two hours the whole world will see how the russian armed forces contrary to all treaties and conventions are crushing the resistance of the hungarian people they will also see how they are kidnapping the prime minister of a country which is a member of the United Nations and taking him from the capital and therefore it cannot be doubted at all that this is the most brutal form of intervention. I should like in these last moments to ask the leaders of the revolution, if they can, to leave the country. I ask that all that I have said in my broadcast and what we have agreed on with the revolutionary leaders during meetings in parliament should be put in a memorandum and the leaders should turn to all the peoples of the world for help and explain that today it is Hungary and tomorrow or the day after tomorrow it will be the turn of other countries because the imperialism of Moscow does not know borders and is only trying to play for time. So here, Imre Naj is different from Gomolka. He doesn't change his tune. Instead, he antes up. What a bold and brave thing to do. By the way, as I look at this, Imre Naj, who's the prime minister, not the president. Sorry about that the leader of Hungary all the same. But, you know, he doesn't, he, he doesn't submit. He doesn't change his tune. He doesn't, you know, go after the revolutionary leaders that he had worked with previously, as he mentions in this statement. He instead says, hey, get out of the country. Uh, tell our story so that the, so the rest of the world can respond and say, no, Soviet Union, you can't do this. Okay, so does the rest of the world respond? How about the United States of America? How do we respond to Hungary? Well, we do nothing. President Harry S. Truman does nothing. Why do we do nothing? Because of the Truman Doctrine. 
The Truman Doctrine had stated that we were only going to contain communism. The one thing that the Truman Doctrine did not state was that we were going to support revolutionary movements within countries that were already communist because this could draw us into a war with the Soviet Union and potentially a nuclear exchange. By 1956, both sides have the atomic bomb. Both sides can kill each other and, and destroy the world, honestly. So the United States of America, by its own policies, lets Hungary fall. All right. But if you were Khrushchev, how would you have responded to this? You're already doing your part to reform the Soviet Union from within to allow for a little bit more freedom of expression and creativity within the Soviet Union. You're engaged in a whole lot of reforms within the Soviet Union, and this is bringing a lot of criticism upon you by these hardliners in the Politburo. Now, if you say, hey, great job, Poland, go free. Okay, Hungary, you too, you do your own thing. You know, you can even leave the Warsaw Pact if you want to, whatever, you know, do your own thing. Become democratic, join NATO. I mean, this is going to be the end of your career. And honestly, sincerely, it might, you know, really, truly weaken the Soviet Union. Of course, this is going to sound great to the United States of America, but Khrushchev, this is your job to, you know, protect the, the, the strength of the Soviet Union and, prob and, and your career as well. You know, so what are you going to do? Well, of course, he's going to try to put down these revolts. But if you're Khrushchev, think about how you could justify it. Think about how you could justify it. You know, one way you could justify it is say that the people that were trying to hold the revolution in Hungary didn't really believe in democracy, but they had other evil intentions. They maybe represented the worst of capitalists. They were trying to somehow financially profit off of this revolution. So here's the Soviet government's response. The course of the events has shown that the working people of Hungary, who have achieved great progress on the basis of their people's democratic order, correctly raise the question of the necessity of eliminating serious shortcomings in the field of economic building, the further raising of the material well-being of the population, and the struggle against bureaucratic excesses in the state apparatus. However, this just and progressive movement of the working people was soon joined by forces of black reaction and counter-revolution, read capitalism, which are trying to take advantage of the discontent of part of the working people to undermine the foundations of the people's democratic order in Hungary and to restore the old landlord and capitalist order. So from the Soviet perspective, or at least the perspective of the Soviet government, are we putting down democratic reform? No. We're trying to stop the emergence of an evil capitalist system emerging in Hungary where you're going to have a handful of rich and a whole bunch of poor. That's why we went in. Uh, Imre Naj was executed after he was captured by the Soviets. All right. The Khrushchev years are also remembered for being great, uh, for, for their great advancements in uh, science, technology, and space. Space exploration. The Soviet Union in 1957 is going to put the first artificial man-made satellite in outer space, Sputnik. A few years later, they will put the first uh, man into outer space, Yuri Gagarin. And not long after that, they put the first female into outer space, Valentina Tereshkova. And all this is happening during the Eisenhower administration during the United States of America. And there was a lot of cultural concern here that the Americans um, were really lagging behind in terms of science and math, and that our educational system was weak, that uh, while the Soviet teenagers were going to school in an oppressive system where they were forced to learn, 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 Americans were busy listening to rock and roll music, which was developing in the 1950s, you know, having their sock hops in the gym, being far more obsessed with uh, cars and uh, than anything related to the space race. You know, Americans were interested in having fun well, the Soviets were working hard, and there was this genuine concern that, you know, the Soviets really were going to bury us. And as the 1950s go into the 1960s, uh, the Soviets uh, captured a U-2 spy pilot, a guy who was flying one of America's uh, secret U-2 spy planes over the Soviet Union. They had captured uh, one of our U-2 pilots, a guy by the name of Gary Powers. And this just is all very humiliating for the United States of America. Going into the 1960s then, Nikita Khrushchev is going to deal with West Berlin. And he deals with West Berlin in a very similar way as his predecessor did. 
He's going to try to isolate West Berlin from the, from the rest of the world. And this is when the Berlin Wall gets constructed. Okay, so the Berlin Wall, which the Soviets have constructed around the perimeter of West Berlin, physically isolating it from the rest of Germany, uh, or the rest of East Germany. Why does Nikita Khrushchev do this? Well, he mostly does this because he wants to stop immigration from happening out of all of the Eastern Bloc countries into West Germany and specifically into West Berlin. In short, he, he wants to stop people from running away. In particular, he had identified what we call a brain drain. Uh, he wanted to stop the immigration of specific people, namely, namely people who, who had jobs that you have to get a lot of college education you know, to get. All right, so let me explain this. If you wanted to be a doctor in the Soviet Union, um, you would go to education's totally free. That sounds great. All of it. Uh, you just have to be smart enough. So let's say you're smart enough to be a doctor. And so, you, you know, you pass all your tests and exams. And you make your way to medical school and you become a medical doctor. Now, technically, in the communist system, being a doctor, you're going to get the same pay as an, an electrician. Now, in practice, you are going to receive some benefits since being a doctor is a highly valued profession. There might be some kickback in this in terms of uh, the apartment that you get issued, uh, the car that you get issued, and maybe you actually get to have a car. You know, there might, there might be some perks for this, but you know, technically everybody's supposed to get paid the same, right? And you might think to yourself, well, if I was in France right now, <laughs> I'd be making a lot of money and have a much better home and several cars and all this stuff, you know, being a doctor and life would be better. So I could vacation to East Berlin, walk to the other side, proclaim I defect and then get out of here and go to France or the United States or Britain or wherever, whoever will take me. And so people were doing this. The Berlin Wall was constructed to stop this type of immigration. And so the wall goes up. Here's a map of West and East Germany. Here you can see East Berlin on the eastern side and that there is West Berlin. And the Berlin Wall, when it goes up, it goes up around the perimeter of West Berlin. And you'll notice that there are several checkpoints. These are military checkpoints where you'd have to go, where you'd have to clear security going from one side to the other. Uh, here's a picture of one of these checkpoints. Uh, here's the construction of the Berlin Wall. I think you've seen this before. Here's an image of the Berlin Wall. Uh, it was built rather quickly. Um, and the construction began everywhere around West Berlin in the middle of the night. Um, there's kind of two parts to the to the Berlin Wall. Uh, the first is, if you look at the on the left-hand side, that would be the side of West Berlin, where you just have the wall and the rounded top on, on it. And then you'd have uh, essentially the stretch of no man's land and you'd have a guard tower, and there'd be uh, East German uh, secret police that would be stationed there at the guard tower. Uh, these guys, they're called uh, the, the state security police. Uh, they were uh, called the Stasi. Stasi is simply a contraction of state security police. That's what they were called in German, the Stasi. And the Stasi, of course, had one order uh, to shoot to kill anybody who was caught trying to run to the other side most likely somebody trying to flee from the east to the west. The Berlin Wall becomes more than anything the symbol for the entire Cold War era. In 1961, the President of the United States of America was President John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy visited West Berlin not long after the construction of the Berlin Wall to see the Berlin Wall and to give a speech to reassure the people of West Berlin that the United States of America still supported them. There, aside from the construction of the war, wall, there were no aggressive acts that Khrushchev was, was making at this time uh, to capture West Berlin, although those plans were in the works. It was something that Khrushchev was doing to try to, um, he did want to capture West Berlin and he wanted to do this to, because if he captures West Berlin, if he could do something that Stalin could never do, then that would shut up the hardliners that were his critics in the Politburo. But, you know, in 61, it was just build the wall around West Berlin. And then, and then West Berlin will fall later with his secret plan that he's putting into effect. But for the people of Germany, and especially the, especially the people of West Berlin, this wall that they could see every day now that surrounded them was emotionally 
this horrible and awful symbol of the world in which they lived. I mean, this wall did divide families. It was the symbol of a divided country, of a divided Europe, and of an incredibly hostile Cold War world. The Soviets hadn't made any aggressive advances aside from the construction of the wall, but it certainly reflected that West Berlin was considered a threat and that West Berlin is probably going to be ground zero for a third world war if that should erupt. All right, so President Kennedy is there to assure the people of West Berlin that um, the United States of America is going to support them being our NATO ally. And so Kennedy gives uh, one of his most famous speeches. And a lot of people don't remember anything about this speech except for the last sentence, which John F. Kennedy says in German to reassure his German audience. And what he wanted to say in German was, I am a Berliner, meaning I'm a citizen of Berlin. I am one of you. We are all in this together. And when he finishes this off and he, you know, he says in German, Ich bin ein Berliner, the crowd erupted in applause. And that is because they heard exactly its intended meaning. However, today, a lot of people like to joke that what John F. Kennedy actually said was, I am a jelly donut. Because in Berlin, there is a pastry uh, filled with jelly that's referred to as a Berliner. And that if John F. Kennedy wanted to say this word grammatically correct, he should have left out the indefinite article of Ein. He should have just simply said, I am Berliner, not, not I am a Berliner. And because of this minor grammatical glitch, what he said was, I am a jelly donut. But there is actually, there is no historical evidence that anybody heard him say, I am a jelly donut. Because if they had have heard that, that is exactly what the press would have reported. This is not how people heard it at the time. Instead, I don't know how this story came around. Probably somebody who knows German really well analyzed exactly what he said and said, uh, he shouldn't have said, I am ein, ich bin ein Berliner. He should have just said, ich bin Berliner. It would have had a different meaning, a slightly different meaning. Uh, what John F. Kennedy actually said is, I'm a jelly donut. Ha ha ha. Isn't that funny? So pardon this silly anecdote, but I feel like it's worth mentioning since this is what people think of when they think of John F. Kennedy's speech, ich bin ein Berliner. Understand the context in which he's there and what he says and why he says it. The people of West Berlin were extraordinarily uh, happy that John F. Kennedy was there and gave the speech that the United States is going to continue to support them. It was a, it was a nice gesture in a dark time. John F. Kennedy supposedly said that if any future American president was ever finding themselves in a political crisis, that they could always go to Berlin and give a speech, support the people of West Berlin, and their popularity back home in the United States of America would soar. Because here's, Amer here's the American president going to West Berlin saying, the United States is great, United States is strong, United States will always support you, hooray, hooray, we're all in this together, and uh, American people, the people of America will love that. Which m might explain future American presidents going and giving speeches in front of the Brandenburg Gate, in front of the Berlin Wall as well. All right, here's a picture of the Berlin Wall from the 1980s. And the Berlin Wall becomes the symbol of uh, freedom versus oppression. It's on the western side of the Berlin Wall where people uh, come to, you know, graffiti and the spray paint. Uh, and this is a symbol of their freedom. And on the eastern side, you see the Stasi marching along the eastern side of the Berlin Wall here. You know, that side represents a communist dictatorship. And so it's the perfect symbol for the entire Cold War era. All right. Uh, this is the American checkpoint and the American sector of Berlin. It is the famous Checkpoint Charlie. All right. So I mentioned that Nikita Khrushchev had something up his sleeve. He wanted to, he did want to take West Berlin. He did want to make it part of East Germany and unite East Germany. He wanted to do this uh, because, you know, he believes in the communist system, obviously, and it would be a great boost for his political career. You get those Politburo guys, those hardliners, to you know quit criticizing him for all of his reforms and to you know support him. All right, so what's Khrushchev's plan? Here's his plan. It involves a completely different country. 90 miles south of Florida is the country of Cuba. In the year 1959, Cuba had a revolution that were led by two revolutionaries, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. When, when Castro and Guevara overthrew the corrupt Batista, 
regime that had been supported by the United States of America. Nobody was exactly sure what type of government Castro was going to establish in Havana, but eventually he declared that they were going to become communist. Is the United States of America, the neighbor of Cuba, going to stand for this? Well, 1960 was an election year in the United States. Eisenhower was going out. John F. Kennedy was elected president. One of the first things that Kennedy does in 1961 when he's president is that he supports a counter-revolutionary invasion. So Cubans who had been driven off of Cuba by Castro are now going to reinvade Cuba. Of course, they're going to get their supplies from the United States of America. They're going to be trained by Americans. They go in and this invasion, this counter-revolutionary invasion called the Bay of Pigs invasion is a complete failure. Kennedy is seen as weak. Kennedy is seen as weak. Castro is seen as strong. The Americans look like buffoons. And after this happens, Fidel Castro knows clearly the United States of America is going to continue to try to overthrow me and my regime here in Havana. And the United States is the United States. We're a little Cuba. He's pretty clear, you know, he's pretty realistic about the situation. If the United States wants to invade Cuba, chances are, you know, the United, and, and, and the United States wants to do it with its full military might, not just, you know, supporting counter-revolutionaries. Chances are pretty good that the United States are, are they're going to win. So, you know, what are you going to do? If you're in Fidel Castro's shoes, what would you do? Well, you'd probably go to this guy. Hey, Khrushchev, may I have your support? Nikita Khrushchev says, yes, I would be happy to support you. The whole world has seen that the United States of America tried to support a counter-revolutionary group. It failed. The United States is silly. Um, they're disrespecting a nation's sovereignty. So the Americans look like fools. So let's kind of, um, we, we've got sort of the, we've got sort of the better hand to play now diplomatically. And Khrushchev and um, Castro in the United Nations, let it be known to the United Nations that the United States of America had attempted to support a counter-revolutionary invasion of Cuba and that the United States of America, therefore, can be seen as threatening the sovereignty of Cuba, which is why, and they are very public about this, the Soviet Union is going to begin supplying Cuba with defensive military supplies, things like anti-aircraft guns, things like missiles, but missiles of a defensive nature. And the United States of America essentially has to agree to this, that the Soviets may place military supplies in Cuba, but these military, this, these, this military, these military supplies are going to be of a defensive nature only. Okay, but here's where Khrushchev makes his bold move. This will be remembered as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Khrushchev decides, and this is his decision, that while the Soviet Union is shipping these military supplies into Cuba, that they are also going to begin shipping, even though it is against what was agreed upon in the United Nations and what they said to the United States of America, they're going to begin sending in offensive nuclear missiles into Cuba. I don't think there's such a thing as a defensive nuclear missile. They're going to be sending in, the Soviet Union is going to begin placing into Cuba offensive nuclear weapons. They're going to do this in secret. And then once they are all installed and ready to activate, then Nikita Khrushchev is going to announce it to the United States and to the world. We have nuclear missiles in Cuba. We can now destroy most of the United States within a matter of 15 minutes we can destroy the United States of America. Now, why did we do this? Well, it's only fair. The United States of America has missiles that are in Turkey, which are just south of the Soviet Union. So if the United States can have missiles in Turkey, we can certainly have missiles in Cuba. Now, United States, if you do not like having these missiles here in Cuba pointed at you, you would like for us to remove them? We will remove them, but we will only remove them if we can have West Berlin. That was it. This was Khrushchev's grand move. This is, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
the United States of America didn't have to wait for Nikita Khrushchev to make this announcement because we were flying secret U-2 spy planes above Cuba that took pictures, pictures like this, that went back to the Pentagon. Um, our uh, Department of Defense were able to identify, the, identify these as nuclear missiles that were you know, being installed in Cuba. And President Kennedy, uh, and this is the famous 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, President Kennedy has to decide how to respond. Uh, pretty much all of his military advisors were telling him, go attack Cuba, go attack Cuba, go attack Cuba. <laughs> there, the Soviet Union has violated international an international agreement. Uh, you have the right to invade Cuba, or to at least bomb Cuba to take out these missiles. And this is where, you know, this is when uh, John F. Kennedy had recently read uh, Barbara Tuckman's book, The Guns of August. You know, and I think that was weighing on his mind a little bit. You know, we have all these military advisors saying, you know, we're threatened, we are under a... Uh, an imminent danger, you know, strike first, strike first, strike first. Do you really want to be the president of the United States of America when these missiles are ready to go and are pointing at us? You know, but he doesn't. He doesn't He doesn't strike. Uh, instead, he um, issues a statement to the Soviet Union. You're now no longer allowed to put any new missiles into Cuba. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't ask for, for the missiles to be with, that are there to be withdrawn, but he uh, blockades Cuba. And then he reaches out through a spy that we knew of who was a Soviet spy who was living in DC we communicated with him to communicate with to cast or to communicate to Khrushchev so in other words JFK to the spy to Khrushchev to work out a deal to get the missiles out and the deal was all right you get your missiles out of Cuba we'll get ours out of Turkey and uh that uh was 13 days and this uh 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis is, so far as we know, the closest that the world has ever come to nuclear war. And really, it is a testimony to the underlying humanity of both Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy that we didn't end up having a nuclear war, because both of these men were under pressure from the respective governments to, to really push the button, to really let the other side have it. And neither of them did. So the United States withdrew its missiles out of Turkey. The consequences of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, John F. Kennedy in the United States of America was seen as, uh, this was considered to be his greatest moment as president of the United States. The United States was under imminent nuclear attack, and he stopped that from happening. And he stopped that from happening in a really peaceful way. The Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military and a lot of people in the government wanted him to attack Cuba, and he didn't. And he still got the missiles out of Cuba. This had the opposite effect to Nikita Khrushchev back in the Soviet Union. His big gamble to win West Berlin through pl placing nuclear missiles in Cuba and threatening the United States of America backfired on him, and he will eventually lose his job. And Nikita Khrushchev loses his job to this other high-ranking member of the Politburo, a man that you see behind him in this image. His name is Leonid Brezhnev. Brezhnev is going to be the next leader, the next premier of the Soviet Union. Uh, he's uh, remembered uh, for his big bushy eyebrows. I don't know if you can tell that from this particular picture or not. The Cuban Missile Crisis was considered to be the closest that the humanity has ever come to nuclear war. And so after the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's sort of a change of spirit between the Soviet Union and the USA. There was a sense that, wow, you know, we really almost did this. We really almost had a nuclear war. And so after the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then in particular <clears throat> at at, as the United States of America is ending or trying to get out of the Vietnam War during the Richard Nixon administration, and Richard Nixon took office in uh, January of 1969, there is a new feeling in the world, and in a new attitude, if I can call it that, of détente. Détente is a French word that means essentially a relaxation. Uh, it's typically defined as peaceful coexistence. The United States of America and the Soviet Union had been, you know, at each other's throat for a couple of decades now, you know, nearly three at this point in time. And there was a sense that we need to back off a little bit. We need to back off. Maybe we can have mutual coexistence. Maybe we can get along. Maybe we can have a bipolar world where part of the world is communist and the other is democratic and capitalist. And that's okay. And so this is the spirit of detente. In this particular image here, you see Leonid Brezhnev. You can see his eyebrows now. <laughs> and then there's our president, Richard Nixon. 
Richard Nixon was a very interesting president in terms of how he handled the Cold War. His entire uh, political career prior to being president was him being a staunch anti-communist. He actually became a very popular senator from California in the 1950s during the, during the thick of the Red Scare when he helped to collect evidence to bust uh, an, a spy by the name of Alger Hiss and to get Alger Hiss locked up. Uh, so he had this reputation of being this uh, passionate anti-communist. But then when he becomes president, he starts doing all of these very interesting things. Now, his ultimate goal is to end the Vietnam War. But he also wants to do his best to destabilize the communist world. And he destabilizes it in this very interesting way. So China had become a communist country in 1949. And when China fell to communism in 49 during the Truman administration, this was seen as an embarrassment for the Truman administration and the United States of America, you know, that we had let this other huge Asian country uh, it fall to communism. And so Nixon's response was interesting. He tried to open up diplomat. Well, he didn't try. He did. He opened up diplomatic relations between the United States of America and China, first by sending over a table tennis team and something called ping pong diplomacy. And then Nixon went over to meet uh, the leader of China himself, Chairman Mao, and the chairman's prime minister, Zhou Enlai. And here Nixon opens up diplomatic relations with China. So here's the United States of America opening up a relationship with a communist country and also setting up the opportunity for trade between our two countries. So now this is a big deal because this is, this is in the news all the time today, the trade and the economic relationship that, that exists between China and the United States of America. It actually began with Richard Nixon, who visits China, opens up trade relations between the United States of America and China. Now, it was a very limited trading relationship that was established. Um, there were certain coastal cities in China that were established as special economic zones or SEZs, and it was only in these ports where the Americans and the Chinese could could, could, could trade, in particular, essentially capitalist Chinese businesses could be developed. But Nixon had opened up trade and, and diplomacy between the United States of America and China. This was an amazing thing. Now, why would Nixon, a passionate anti-communist, do this? Why would he be shaking hands with a communist revolutionary like Mao, who had himself killed, just like Stalin, millions of his own people through brutal collectivization policies and had instituted a cultural revolution in which they destroyed a lot of Chinese history, like why, this guy was a brutal dictator, uh, killed more of his own people than Stalin killed. Uh, so why would, why would Nixon shake his hand? Well, Nixon's trying to destabilize the communist world. By, be, by establishing a friendly relationship with China, he's essentially getting China to step away from the Soviet Union and to become closer friends with the United States of America. It was a brilliant move and arguably it worked. The United States of America and China developed a close relationship, even though China's communist. Now, this will have an impact later on in history uh, when the rest of the communist world falls and it begins to fall in 1989. Uh, China does not fall. And there's a whole story behind that. But, you know, China remains a communist country today and has a favorable relationship, arguably, with the United States of America. But now, back in the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev Here's a guy who's in charge of the USSR. And for the first time since Stalin passed away, there's a new sense of, well, in which direction is the Soviet Union going to go now? What type of leader is Brezhnev going to be? All right. Brezhnev is going to show his true colors for the first time in how he deals with our country here, Czechoslovakia. All right, 1968 was a crazy year. It was the year that began with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, where the Viet Cong rose up in every major city in South Vietnam. The United States military was on its heels. It was a year of assassinations in the United States of America. Martin Luther King Jr. killed in 1968. Bobby Kennedy killed in 1968. It was a year of protest. The last time there is uh, a, C, uh, a, a Paris Commune is in 1968, where students at the Sorbonne, the University of Paris rose up and actually took over a part of Paris. And then uh, uh, workers, Parisian workers, uh, decided to go on a general strike and support the students. They took over Paris for a period of time. Um, 
and this created a, a crisis in the, in the French Fifth Republic. But not long after that, in Chicago, Illinois, uh, young people in the United States um, protested uh, the Democratic National Convention uh, trying to get a candidate that would pull the United States of America, of America out of the Vietnam War. And they actually made their way into the convention hall. So there was pushing and shoving. And, and then on the streets of Chicago, it was sheer violence. It was a crazy year of radical activity, and Czechoslovakia was a part of that. In January of 1968, Czechoslovakia has a new head of state, and his name is Alexander Dubček. And in the late 1960s, Dubček attempts to reform Czechoslovakia. So here's what he does not do. He does not try to democratize Czechoslovakia. He does not want any type of multi-party system. No, there's still going to be a single communist party. However, he wants to institute reforms that he calls socialism with a human face. So, hey, by the way, there's Dubček on Time magazine, that St. Vitus Cathedral behind him. Here's what socialism with a human face is all about. We have a single party communist state that doesn't change, but... He wants to permit artistic and scientific freedom. In other words, when it comes to literally the arts and the sciences, he wants to stop the top-down government instruction in terms of what people should do, and he wants to free the people to express themselves artistically, creatively, and for uh, probably universities and other research institutions to do their own scientific research. So these people are to be freed. Guys, this was the 1960s. Back here, this is 1968. Back here in the United States of America, there's sex, drugs, and rock and roll. In Czechoslovakia, hearing that there is going to be artistic freedom, and that is the leader of your country who's telling you you're going to have your freedom. You can express yourself however you'd like, you're not allowed to form a political party, but you're allowed to express yourself however you like in whatever creative ways, musically, artistically, film, theater, poetry, literature, you know, have at it, uh, comedy, sat satire. You can do any of these things. The students went to the streets in support, namely Wenceslas Square. And that's what you're looking at right here. Young people, mostly students, in Wenceslas Square, you see him standing at the base of the statue of King Wenceslas there, cheering, parading, and partying in full support of Alexander Dubček. Guys, this is hard to explain. This is called the Prague Spring. It's hard to explain because we don't live in a press an oppressive society like the Czechoslovaks did back in 68. Imagine growing up in a world where you know that if you say the wrong thing, or let's say, let's say you listen to the Beatles. Let's say you listen to the Beatles in 68. And the Beatles extraordinarily popular, the biggest rock band of all time, arguably, and they're at their zenith in 68. And everybody in the West is listening to them. Well, let's say, you know, you're able to listen to the Beatles however you would be able to listen to the Beatles. Like, or even if you say, hey, I'd really like to listen to the Beatles. Well, you might be identified then as pro-Western. You know, let's say one of your teachers heard you say that. And the teacher would be like, all right, that person is, uh, seems to be very uh, pro-British, pro-American. They, 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 they like the Beatles. All right, we're going to mark that person down. We're going to identify that person. That person is not going to get a university education. They will not have a good job. That person is going to be a dishwasher for the rest of their life. So imagine you grew up in that type of situation where you had to be very careful who you expressed yourself to. I mean, how did you grow up like that? Where you're going to grow up quiet, keeping your cards close to your chest. You probably have a very bottled up sense of oppression, but you know that everybody else has this bottled up sense of oppression too. But if you're going to survive in life, well, you eventually learn, I've got to be a good communist. I sort of have to toe the party line. I have to say the right things, support the right things. And that's how I advance in this society. And then along comes Alexander Dubček, the leader of your country. And now he says... We are going to have artistic freedom in our country. We're going to have scientific freedom in our country. I mean, this might as well be Rudolph II all over again. This is going to be the next second golden age of Prague. And literally the young people respond with festivities. They hit the streets. They party. They celebrate. They sing songs. They dance. 
And it was this incredible moment in history, Prague Spring of 1968. But Leonid Brezhnev has to respond to this. And if you're Brezhnev, how do you respond? Do you respond by doing nothing? What do you do? Well, how Brezhnev chose to respond was he issued, it wasn't just the Soviet military this time, he got the Warsaw Pact involved. But the Warsaw Pact countries are going to send in a military force into Prague. And they are going to force students and other young people out of the streets to clear the streets of Prague. Go home. This was obviously a very sad, disheartening moment for a lot of the young people of Prague. Some of them resisted, and some of them were killed. Others were wounded, but eventually the streets were cleared. Now, Alexander Dubček was not like Imre Naj of Hungary in 56. When the Warsaw Pact tanks showed up, Alexander Dubček started issuing statements over the radio saying, don't resist, don't resist, don't resist. And because he issued the command telling the students to not resist the Soviet tanks and to go home to get out of the streets, Alexander Dubček will not be killed by the Soviets. He will just simply be identified as an incompetent leader, and he gets reassigned to a low-level job in the forestry department in Czechoslovakia and placed in eastern Slovakia. But Dubček lives. Prague Spring lasted for approximately half a year, and it was this great explosion of energy and cultural creativity that happened in Prague, it would have been an amazing time to have been a young person to be living in Prague at 68, only to have your hopes dashed. There have been several books that and, and films that have come out of Prague Spring of 68. This is probably the most famous. A book was written by the uh, about this by a Czech writer called The Unbearable Lightness of Being. In the late 1980s, it was made into a, uh, a movie, which was received a high critical acclaim um, starring uh, the Irish actor Daniel Day-Lewis and the French actor actress Juliette Binoche. And the film's pretty impressive for an 80s film because it weaves together actual film footage of the Soviet tanks rolling in with actors, um, you know, reenacting it all at the same time. But there are several books and movies about the Prague Spring of 68 if you're interested. After it all happens, Brezhnev decides to defend himself by giving, by making a statement that is now referred to as the Brezhnev Doctrine. And the Brezhnev Doctrine states this, if the Soviet Union perceives in any communist country, and this isn't just a Warsaw Pact country, this, this is, a, this is a, any communist country, if the Soviet Union perce perceives a counter-revolutionary or capitalist uprising to overthrow the communist government, then the Soviet Union may intervene. Then the Soviet Union may intervene. So once again, just like with Hungary in 56, the Soviet Union's government, this time it's Brezhnev, they said what was happening in Czechoslovakia in 68 was not, was not about freedom of expression. It was about capitalist pro-Western groups trying to support this reform movement only so this reform movement would lead to the collapse of communism even though Dubček specifically said, we're still going to have a one-party communist system. But Brezhnev lays this down as the Brezhnev Doctrine. All right. Present at the Prague Spring of 68 was one of Czechoslovakia's most famous writers at the time. He was a young man. His star was still rising in 68, but he was very well known. He was, in, he was very inspired by Alexander Dubček and, uh, and, and the Prague Spring as a whole. And his name was Václav Havel. Václav Havel was a playwright. He was a writer. He was an essayist. He was a poet. He came from a family of entertainers. His grandfather had built one of the first, well not first, but a really big theater in downtown Prague. When the Nazis invaded Václav Havel and his family, lived mostly out in rural Czechoslovakia, doing their best to hide from the Nazis to survive the occupation. When he grew up, he spent some time in the Czechoslovakian military. And then after he served in the military, he worked on getting involved in the arts, becoming a writer himself, became a playwright. And a lot of his plays are very absurdist. 
And there's something about probably growing up in a total under a totalitarian regime where there's extreme censorship that lends itself to, you know, writing plays about just really bizarre, fantastical situations. Uh, sometimes he even has his characters speak a gibberish. But that way, you know, if you write about these really bizarre situations, it's not really that concrete what's happening. Then you can kind of slip in some satire or some criticism of the current system in which you find yourself living. Yes, and Václav Havel also drew inspiration from another Czech writer from the dawn of the 20th century, a man by the name of Franz Kafka, who also wrote about human beings finding themselves in these rather extraordinary, surrealistic, weird situations. And Franz Kafka is considered to be one of the greatest Czech writers of all time and one of the greatest writers of the early 20th century. So Havel was a writer, and he hung out with other writers and artists and people like this. What you're looking at here is a picture of a rock and roll band, or actually more accurately, a progressive rock band that played rather experimental, exploratory, and just downright bizarre and weird music. The name of this band was called the Plastic People of the Universe, and they were called the Plastic People of the Universe in English. They took the title of their band from a Frank Zappa song. Frank Zappa was an experimental, psychedelic American musician from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And um, they, 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 they played experimental, progressive rock music. And look at them. I mean, they look like rock musicians. They got long hair, they got t-shirts, they wear blue jeans. And these guys were put in jail. Now, why were they put in jail? Was their music somehow anti-establishment? Well, no. Their music was just rather bizarre. A little bit like Václav Havel's plays, they were kind of absurdist. One of the guys in the band worked in a slaughterhouse and he wrote a whole song about what it's like to slaughter a cow. That song doesn't sound very political to most people. So why were they thrown into jail? And I mean, they were put in jail for years. Well, the technical reason why they were placed in jail for the first time was for quote unquote, disturbing the peace. So in other words, they were playing weird music too loudly. So when they got out of jail the first time, they went out into a field without anybody around and they told people come and listen to us in a farm field in the middle of nowhere. People did and they were arrested again. Once again, disturbing the peace. What's really going on here? Well, here's what's really going on. They look Western. They look like rock stars. They look like the Beatles. And that in itself was anti-establishment. So the plastic people of the universe a Czech rock band, an experimental rock band, thrown into jail. These guys who are friends of Václav Havel. I do think it's interesting, rock stars of the 60s. It doesn't matter on what side of the Iron Curtain you were on, you'd be as identified as, as, as anti-establishment. If these guys lived in the United States of America in the early 1970s, they would be seen as, they'd be identified as long-haired hippies, anti-establishment. They'd probably be called communists over here. And yet on the other side of the Iron Curtain, they were seen as pro-Western. I tell you, poor hippies, they can never find a home. All right. While the plastic people in the universe are in jail, while Václav Havel is mourning the fact that they are in jail, the leaders of the Warsaw Pact, including the Soviet Union, and the leaders of NATO, including the United States of America, meet in Finland to discuss the New World Order in the year 1975. In 1975, Vietnam had unified, Saigon had fallen, the United States of America has officially lost the Vietnam War. The Cuban Missile Crisis has come and gone over 10 years before, and a new spirit is in the air. The fact that it's been 30 years since the end of World War II, the Soviet Union isn't going anywhere, the United States of America isn't going anywhere, can't we all just get along? Can't we create a new world where the Soviet Union and the United States of America don't threaten imminent nuclear destruction at any moment? Can't we come up with some new international rules to create a new peaceful world? And yes, that is what the Helsinki meeting is all about in 1975. The Helsinki Accords are the best example of detente during the entirety of the Cold War era. The United States of America and the Soviet Union and every other country in the Warsaw Pact and, and NATO and other countries as well, they get together and they come up with 10 rules, 10 rules that every country is expected to respect. And here are those 10 rules. 
The first four, four rules deal with countries, especially the United States of America and the Soviet Union, respecting the sovereignty and boundary of other countries. So in other words, hey, United States of America, Vietnam is now a communist country. You have to let them be a communist country. You're not to go into Vietnam anymore ever. You let them do whatever it is they want to do. All right. And hey, Soviet Union, there's a little something called West Berlin. West Berlin is going to remain West Berlin. And West Berlin is not going to become communist unless those West Berliners choose to become communist. Number five addresses resolving disputes peacefully, probably via the United Nations, rather than threatening war. Number six relates to countries not interfering in the internal affairs of other countries. And then number seven demands for respect for human rights. Number seven states that all countries will respect human rights. All right, human rights like what? Human rights and fundamental freedoms, including freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom of belief. All right, to freedom to have your own thoughts, to have your own opinions, to have your own conscience, to have your own religion, to have your own system of belief. All right. And everybody signs that. All right. Number eight, we respect the self-determination of, all, of other people. So if the United States, uh, if a country that you are friends with wants to become communist, you have to let them become communist. Number nine states that states are going to cooperate with each other and respect each other's laws. And number 10, simply to obey international laws. These are the Helsinki Accords. So what the Helsinki Accords met in 1975 was that there is a communist world and there's a democratic world. And the democratic world isn't to mess with the communist world and neither, neither is the communist world going to mess with the democratic world. Everybody's going to respect each other. We've got the boundaries of these countries and these countries are going to last forever and ever and ever. And that, and this number seven becomes an important thing in Czechoslovakia, that all countries are going to respect the human rights of people within their countries. So we have to wonder if a communist country like Czechoslovakia signs this, where there is extreme censorship, where there is extreme oppression for freedom of expression, you know, what are they thinking? Well, they're probably thinking this. We're going to agree to this, but the other aspect of the Helsinki Accords is no other government is allowed to mess with us. So we can do whatever we want. So if we don't like what a rock band is playing, like we'll lock them up and what are, the, what are other countries going to do? But the Helsinki Accords inspires Václav Havel and a group of artists and writers and musicians in Czechoslovakia. They form an organization that is not technically an organization in December of 1976. And they write a declaration of principles. They call themselves Charter 77. They call themselves Charter 77 because they're going to release their declaration in, on January the 1st of 1977. And all Charter 77 is, is a declaration of principles, a declaration of ideas. It specifically says, our country signed the Helsinki Accords. The Helsinki Accords said, there is to be freedom of thought, of conscience, and of belief. And we therefore believe that the people of Czechoslovakia should be able to express themselves however they would like to. They specifically state that we are in no way, shape, or form any type of official organization. We are certainly not a political organization. The signatories of Charter 77 are simply individuals who believe in freedom of expression. And we believe society will flourish and become more wonderful once there is freedom of expression. This was Charter 77. Charter 77, and Václav Havel was one of the most important writers of the Declaration of Principles. They were able to sneak this statement out to other countries. And needless to, needless to say, when they did this, this makes Charter 77 uh, a, a group of artists that are going to be celebrated internationally as dissidents. A dissident is an individual who tries to rebel against the establishment. A dissident. These dissidents were, of course, celebrated in Western Europe and throughout the United States of America. People who are trying to rise up against the communist system. Or at least, to, if not trying to overthrow the communist system, trying to advocate for freedom of expression. But in Czechoslovakia, Václav Havel, go figure, becomes a marked man. The state police followed him everywhere. 
He knew that in his own home, his phone line was bugged. Everything that he said, the government listened to. Most likely the rooms were bugged. Everything he said, the government listened to. Everywhere he went, spies followed him to listen in to what he was saying, who he was interacting with, where he was going. Imagine what life would be like. Václav Havel at least had a sense of humor. He would notice the secret policemen that were constantly following him. And, you know, he would give them nicknames and, you know, wave to them and such. But all Václav Havel had done was advocated for freedom of expression. He just had simply done so in a very public way. Václav Havel came from a family that was tied in with the history of Prague and the history of the development of entertainment in Prague. Václav Havel was influenced by the great Czech writer Franz Kafka. We as students of European history can look at Václav Havel as the, cul as the culmination of all of this creative wildness that has always existed in Prague, going all the way back to Jan Hus, the Prague Golden Age under Rudolf II, the fight against tyranny against the Nazis, and then during the Prague Spring, of which Václav Havel was a part. And Havel begins to feel the inspiration to develop a philosophy for how to fight tyranny. And so he wrote an essay. His essay was called The Power of the Powerless. He daringly published it in 1979. In it, he deals with the fundamental question. If you live in a totalitarian system of complete oppression, how do you find meaning in your life? And how do you live a moral or good life? This is essentially the fundamental question that he asks in The Power of the Powerless. If you live in a system where you have no freedom, then a certain numbness sets in because you're essentially forced to live a lie. So he talks about a particular green grocer in The Power of the Powerless who puts pro-communist stickers on his window, statements like, workers of the world unite. And Havel wonders, or asks his reader, you know, why does he do this? Well, everybody knows why he does this. He does this because he's told to do it. He's expected to do it. This is what you do in an oppressive totalitarian system. You do what you're told to do and you don't think about it. You don't question it. There's no morality behind it. You're just, you're just, you're just part of the machine. You're do, you do what you're told to do. And that's what everybody does. And when everybody does it, this is what Václav Havel begins to call a post-totalitarian system. A system in which everybody is essentially living in a lie. And nearly everybody understands at some level that it is a lie. When the communist government of Czechoslovakia tells you that our communist state is the end of evolution, the evolution of societies from a feudal system through a capitalist system, through a socialist system, now a communist system, and we're the, at the vanguard of humanity, and you're told to agree with this, then you agree with it. But you know it's a lie. But you have to agree with it. And this has a particular effect on you. You go numb. You get quiet. You keep your thoughts to yourself. There's no advantage to having your own opinion. But in The Power of the Powerless, Václav Havel encourages his readers to live in truth. And how do you live in truth in an oppressive system? Well, you disobey. When you disobey, you affirm your own individual identity. You can be creative. You can be kind. You can be moral. You can begin the process of thinking for yourself. And when you do that, even on a small scale, you're an inspiration for others. And maybe more people will begin the process of living in truth. Václav Havel's essay, The Power of the Powerless, is considered to be one of the greatest work of a dissident that could come out of the entire Cold War era. It was an amazingly brave thing to publish it. He was already being tracked by the Czechoslovak government. After he publishes this work, he's going to be arrested and go to jail for four years. As the 1970s comes to a close in the 1980s dawn, Václav Havel is finding him, finds himself in jail. Jail will actually wear down his health. He'll catch pneumonia. He becomes extraordinarily sick, but he will survive his jail term. His spirit will not be broken, and in fact, it actually grows in jail. And when he reemerges in the 1980s, the Cold War is starting to change. There's a new president in the White House in the United States, and there's a new premier 
of the Soviet Union in the Kremlin, and the Cold War comes to a head in, in the 1980s. And that, students, is what we'll talk about in the next lecture, or rather what I will talk about in the next lecture. Hey, this was a long one, guys, but I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to return and learn more about Václav Havel and Czechoslovakia and how the Cold War comes to an end in the next lecture. I'll talk to you then. See you guys. Have a great day.